I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step algorithm we can follow to perform Gaussian elimination on a matrix. Once you understand Gaussian elimination, you don't really have to follow these steps, but you might find it's more efficient to just always use the same process. Gaussian elimination is a sequence of elementary row operations done to transform a matrix into its row echelon form. When it's in this form, if it's representing a system of linear equations, the system can quite easily be solved. So I'll also show you, after performing Gaussian elimination, how to finish the process and solve the system of linear equations that the matrix represents. Link in the description to my lesson on row echelon form if you want to review that more thoroughly. There are also chapters in the description so you can skip around the video. We're going to do two examples where the solution set has a couple free variables, and we'll do one example where there are no free variables and we just get one explicit solution. So let's look at the steps necessary to carry out Gaussian elimination with our first example. And this is from the Howard Anton text, Elementary Linear Algebra. We're going to perform Gaussian elimination on this matrix, and you'll see all the steps that are necessary. Step one is to locate the leftmost column of the matrix that does not consist entirely of zeros. This is where our work begins. And in this matrix, the leftmost column does not consist entirely of zeros. So that's the column we're focusing on. Then we want the top of the column to be non-zero. So step two is to interchange the top row with another row if necessary to bring a non-zero entry to the top of the column that we found in step one. In this case, that entry at the top of our column is zero. So we'll exchange the first row with the second row. And that gets us here after we do step two. So the first and second rows were interchanged and now this first entry at the top of our column is not zero. Remember, the goal of Gaussian elimination is to transform a matrix into its row echelon form, which means we want all zero rows at the bottom of the matrix, we want the leading entries to be one, and we want zeros below all of those leading entries. So now that we have this non-zero leading entry, we want it to be one. So step three is if the entry that's now at the top of the column found in step one is A, we want to multiply the first row by one over A in order to introduce a leading one. So this entry is two, we want to multiply the row by one over two to turn that two into a one. So we multiply by a half, the two becomes a one as desired, the four becomes a two, negative 10 becomes negative five, and so on. But importantly, this leading entry is now a one. And the use of having a one as the leading entry is now it's easy to add suitable multiples of this top row to the rows below so that all the entries below the leading one become zeros. We've got this two below the leading one. We want that to be a zero. So we just add negative two times row one to row three. So negative two times the first row gets added to the third row, and now we have this matrix. And importantly, we see there are all zeros between the one in this first column. With the goal of getting this matrix into row echelon form, our work with row one and column one is now done. We have a leading one in the row, and the column has zeros below the leading one. So we can move on to step five, where we essentially cover the top row in the matrix and begin again with step one, but now applied to the submatrix that remains once we cover up row one. So in this submatrix, we again identify the leftmost non-zero column and continue repeating the steps as before until the matrix is in row echelon form. So here in this leftmost column, our leading entry, ignoring row one, because our work with that is done, is negative two. We want that to become a one, so we multiply row two by negative one half. And then we can use this one and add negative five copies of row two to row three. That way we turn this five into a zero and proceed in this manner. Once we get this leading entry to be a one, our work with row two is done. So we can cover up the row and go back to step one, now focusing on the very small sub matrix that remains. The only step left is to multiply row three 
by two in order to turn its leading entry into a one. And this matrix is now in row echelon form. The leading entries are all ones that have this staircase pattern where each leading one is further to the right than the leading one above it. Any row of all zeros is at the bottom of the matrix. In this case, there is no row of all zeros and each leading one has zeros below it. So this is in row echelon form. We have completed Gaussian elimination. Now that the matrix is in row echelon form, we can solve the system of linear equations that it might represent. To use Gaussian elimination in order to solve a system of linear equations, once you complete the Gaussian elimination and get the matrix into row echelon form, you can take the matrix and turn it back into a system of linear equations. That gives us this. We're just taking the coefficients. So 1x1 plus 2x2 minus 5x3 plus 3x4 plus 6x5 equals 14, and so on for the other rows. Notice in the equation from row 2, for example, I haven't written 0x4. I have just included this space here, though, so you can see there are no x4s in this second equation. Once you have your reduced system of equations that comes from that row reduced echelon form, you want to solve for the leading variables. So everything except x1, we move to the other side of the equation. So x1 equals 14 14 minus 2x2, and so on. x3, we added 7 halves x5 to the other side of the equation, so x3 equals negative 6 plus 7 halves x5. And x5 is just equal to 2. So again, you get your system of equations and then solve for the leading variables. Those are the variables in the front. Then we complete a simple process called back substitution, beginning with your bottom equation, plug it in to the above equation. So x3 is equal to negative 6 plus 7 halves x5, but we know x5 is equal to 2. So if we plug 2 in here, we have 7 halves times 2, which is just 7. And negative 6 plus 7 is positive 1. And so we have that x3 is equal to positive 1. Then we plug these two equations into the above equation. x1 is equal to 14 minus 2x2 plus 5x3, but we know x3 is equal to 1, so this is just 5. Minus 3x4 and then minus 6x5, but we know x5 is equal to 2, so 6x5 is just 12, and that gives us this equation. x1 is equal to 14 minus 2x2 plus 5, minus 3x4, minus 12. Combining the 14, the 5, and the minus 12, we have the x1 equals 7, minus 2x2, minus 3x4. And we've completed this back substitution process. And with that, we can describe the general solution with these parametric equations. We see that x2 and x4 were free variables, right? x2, x4, they don't have any restrictions in our system of equations. So we'll just say let x2 equal r and x4 equal s. Those are just parameters. We're calling them r and s. So then our solution is this set of equations. x1 is equal to 7 minus 2x2, but x2 is r, so 7 minus 2r, minus 3 times s. x2 is a free variable. It's equal to r. x3 is equal to 1. We figured that out. x4 is a free variable. It's equal to s. And x5, we figured out, was 2. And this is the general solution. So if you represent a system of linear equations as a matrix, this is how you can use Gaussian elimination in order to solve it. You're not always going to need parameters to describe your solutions. We did in this case, though, because we have more unknowns than we have equations. So there's going to be some free variables. In this example, there will not be parameters in our solution. We've got three equations and we've got three variables. Let's solve this system by Gaussian elimination. And I've included the five steps here for your reference. The first thing we do is take our system of linear equations and represent it as an augmented matrix. So the coefficients of the x1s are in column 1, the coefficients of the x2s are in column 2, and so on with the constants in column 4, which, just to make it easier to look at, I've separated with a dotted line, though that is not necessary. 
we begin by identifying our leftmost non-zero column. In this case, it's column 1. Then we want to turn the entry at the top of column 1 into a 1. In this case, it's already a 1, so we are already on to step 4, where we need to add suitable multiples of the top row to the rows below so that all entries below the leading one become zeros. So to do that, we'll add one copy of row 1 to row 2, turning that negative 1 into a 0. And we'll add negative 3 copies of row 1 to row 3 turning this 3 into a 0. This is the resulting matrix. And I've put some of these numbers, namely column 1 and row 1, in gray because our work with them is now done. We have this leading 1 and zeros below it. So we now repeat the process focusing on this submatrix. The leftmost column is column 2, and the leading entry here at the top is negative 1. So we'll multiply row 2 by negative 1 in order to turn that leading entry into a positive 1. Now our work with this row is done, but we still need to add 10 copies of row 2 to row 3 in order to turn this negative 10 into a 0. And that gets us here. To be consistent in my coloring, I should turn this 0 into a gray because our work with this column is now done. And we're focusing on this submatrix now. Our leftmost non-zero column is column 3. And the only step that remains here is to multiply row 3 by negative 1 over 52 to turn this leading entry into a positive 1. And now we've got the matrix in row echelon form. We've completed Gaussian elimination. Then we take our row echelon matrix and turn it back into a system of linear equations. That gives us x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 equals 8, x2 minus 5x3 equals negative 9, and x3 equals 2. We then carry out that back substitution process, plugging this into this and then this into this. First, we plug x3 equals 2 into this equation, giving x2 minus 10 equals negative 9, and so x2 is equal to 1. Then we can plug all of our known information into this equation. So we have x1 plus x2, which is 1, so x1 plus 1, plus 2x3, x3 is 2, so that's plus 4, equals 8, which means x1 equals 3. And so we have the solution to the system. x1 equals 3, x2 equals 1, and x3 equals 2. Here's one more example, if it's useful, where again we have free variables. We've got more unknowns than equations. So this is a matrix having already had Gaussian elimination done to it. It is in row echelon form. So we can take this and turn it into a system of equations, which we see here, these three equations. I've made this one red because it's already a final solution. The other two equations we need to solve for the leading variables, since they're not already solved for the leading variable. That gives us this, x1 equals, move all this stuff to the right, and x3 equals, move all of this stuff to the right. And then we do that back substitution process. We know already that x6 is equal to 1 third, so we can take that and plug it into x3. That gives us that x3 is equal to 1 minus 2x4 minus 3 times a third, which is just minus 1. And that minus 1 cancels out with that plus 1, which leaves x3 equals negative 2x4. That then gets plugged in to our equation for x1. x1 equals negative 3 x2 plus 2x3, but we know that x3 is minus 2x4, so that's just minus 4x4, and then minus 2x5, and that's our equation for x1. So you can see our free variables are x2, x4, and x5. They can be whatever they want, whereas there are restrictions on x6, x3, and x1. And so here is the general solution in terms of parametric equations. x2 is r, x4 is s, and x5 is t. Again, these are free variables, so we'll make those our parameters r, s, and t. The solution then is x1 equals negative 3r minus 4s minus 2t. x2 equals r, x3 equals negative 2s, x4 equals s, x5 equals t, and x6, of course, is one-third. 
And here are the steps again in case you wanted to have another look. That's your guide to Gaussian elimination. Again, you don't have to follow these steps. If you know the goal of Gaussian elimination, just perform whatever row operations you feel like. But you might find it more efficient to follow the same procedure each time. That's how you do it, and that's how you can use it to solve a system of linear equations. Link in the description to a video where we solve some more problems for extra practice. Be sure to check out my linear algebra playlist, and if you find these lessons helpful, please consider supporting Wrath of Math on Patreon. It's a huge help. Link in the description. Bye.